In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. Contained in these verses, it's giving us kind of a hint of uh, where, where the fall of Satan took place in history. And, um, and so we're going to look at that and kind of unpack some things that I, I think there's um, even within that, that, that teaching about the fall of Satan, there's a lot of even spiritual application for us personally that we can take uh, for our own lives. And so I wanted to recap really quick because I think what we talked about last time is really going to go with and kind of set, set up uh, what we're going to talk about today in these uh, next verses. So last time we talked about creation being uh, created by God for the purpose of expressing his glory. Creation is, like Psalm 19 will say, creation is speech. It's it's expressing things. It's communicating things about God and who he is. Um, we also talked about how Jesus existed with the Father uh, before the creation of the world, that Jesus was there with the Father and all things were created through him. And so Genesis 1, we can know that within these first verses of the Bible, we're seeing Jesus playing a part in this story and um, and not just playing a part, but being kind of the, the point of the story. So all things were created through Jesus and for him. And again, creation was, creation was made as speech uh, to communicate and, and express God's glory. So what's interesting, what we're going to get into is why, why in the world do we see some of these descriptions of creation here? So Again, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. Okay, there's something off there to me. If, if we're really stopping and thinking about this, if we take all the scriptures we've looked at about what the purpose of creation was uh, to declare God's nature, and then we look at God's nature uh, of, of goodness and light and truth and peace and order, but then we're saying that here in God's creation is the existence of something that is formless, void, and darkness that's over the surface of the deep. And so what I'm going to kind of argue for here, and there's there's people who strongly would disagree with this interpretation. I don't think this is a huge dividing issue. I think there's probably a lot here that I'll continue to adjust on in my views of this in the future. But as best as I can tell, I feel like this, these first couple uh, verses in Genesis uh, 1 are giving some indication of the fall of Satan. They're, they're pointing us to that event and, uh, and kind of laying and setting the stage for what this world is that we're living in and, and kind of what, what's kind of was going on before it all happened and, and kind of what the purpose of everything is now. So, so again, what, what I'm about to say, I'm not 100% dogmatic on. Um, I think my views may adjust. Uh, again, there's many who don't agree with this interpretation that this is uh, referencing the fall of Satan. Um, but again, I do think there are some good clues and indications all throughout scripture that would uh, that lead me to believe that this is pointing to um, being the fall of Satan being referenced here. So a couple of things we know, we know that at some point Satan fell. We know biblically that Satan uh, uh, somehow, uh, God, God was before all things. And so Satan is this created being, but now he's against God. He's against the people of God. So at some point, something had to happen. He had to have fallen. And obviously there are scriptures that are used to, um, to kind of teach us about that and, and are applied to that circumstance. But I'm, what I'm saying is that if the Bible, if we know from the Bible, if we know from the scriptures that there was a point in time that Satan fell, I think it's it's reasonable to conclude that we can we're going to look in scripture and we're going to find places, even if it's not clearly spelled out, maybe as clearly and emphatically as other doctrines are. I think the scriptures give us indications and they point us and, and kind of inform us at least a little bit on on that event. So why talk about this? Why I think and this is more just about these foundation. <clears throat> teachings altogether. So starting in Genesis and, and, and laying these foundations, what's what's the point of this? Uh, put simply, there's a story being told in the Bible. There's a story being told about humanity that involves you and me as individuals. And, and I think knowing kind of what's the backdrop of the story, um, if we just kind of plunge right into the middle of the story, 
Um, it's kind of like if you if you walk into the middle of a movie and you sit down and and suddenly you're like in the middle of the plot, you're going to not really know what's going on. You're going to be a little bit disoriented. Um, and, and the purpose is not going to be as clear to you. But if you start at the beginning and you kind of have this, this idea of what the story was, where, where everything began, what it, what all led up to humanity and you as an individual coming into this world, I think it kind of helps, uh, uh, again, lay a foundation for what your purpose is, what, what God's will is for your life, why we're here, what this war, the spiritual war is that we're in. And I think uh, it has a lot of practical benefit as we are living our lives as disciples following Jesus. So all that said, I want to jump into Genesis 1, 1 through 2. I'm hoping we'll get through all this. I think there's a lot of really interesting things in Scripture that uh, reference the fall of Satan. Uh, I just think this is a very kind of interesting and dramatic uh, aspect of Scripture. So I believe that in Genesis 1-2, we are seeing that something has gone wrong in God's creation. Some would argue that the darkness, void, and formlessness that we see in Genesis uh, 1-2 was simply God's blank canvas. That's that's how some people would word it, that this was just God's blank canvas that he, he started out with to begin his work of creation. I very much struggle with this view. Uh, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So if God made creation as a visible expression of his nature and character, which I think is what he did, as we saw in the last uh, episode, if that's the case, if creation is, is meant to be a visible expression of God's nature and character, then why would his first act of creation be to bring into existence something that is formless, void, and darkness? Why would that be what he brought into reality? Do these qualities express anything about God's character? No, I don't believe so. So again, what is going on in Genesis 1-2? Why, if if creation is meant to speak about God, are we seeing formlessness, void, and darkness? Um, I believe, again, this is pointing to the fall of Satan and his rebellious angel. So it wasn't just Satan that that fell and that was cast down to the earth. I believe it was um, a third of the angels, I think is what scriptures will indicate. They were cast out of heaven, separated from God uh, to the earth. So these words, formless, void, and darkness, when we start to unpack these words and what the the Hebrew meaning behind these words is, uh, in Genesis 1, where it says the earth was formless, void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, I think it starts to show that, man, I think there's really good reason to believe that there's a, there's something going on here. There there's There's something, there's some kind of drama going on here that isn't, um, being expressly stated, but I think when you dig into it a little bit, you see that there is definitely something going on here. So first it says the earth was without form and void. So that word was, it comes from the Hebrew word hayata, however you say that. And that means to become altogether accomplished, committed, like break, cause, to exist, be or become, to come to pass. So I bring this up because a lot of people interpret this and and this word is used in other places to to convey the idea of something becoming, of something uh, coming to pass. Something that wasn't before the case becomes the case. So if that's the case, if that's the way this word should be interpreted, then Genesis 1-2 could read, the earth became without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How much time was there between the beginning when God originally created the heavens and the earth, and then this this point in time where it says the earth, which, and I think there's good reason to believe that that the word could be interpreted to say the earth became without form and void. So God originally created everything, again, as an expression of himself, his goodness and his glory, the original creation of the heavens and the earth was good, uh, but at some point it became without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. So I think there could be a space of time, who knows, maybe maybe uh, years, maybe billions of years. I don't, I don't know. I don't think it really matters. But the point is, is that I think in here, if you dig into this a little bit, it opens room for there to be some events that took place within this span of time. And I think what took place is the fall of Satan that caused Genesis 1-2 uh, 
uh, and cause creation to be in the state it's in. So formless, it says the earth was without form or formless and void. So the word formless, uh, the, the Hebrew word is tohu, to lie waste, desolation, desert, a worthless thing, vain, confusion, empty place, without form, nothing, vain, vanity, waste, wilderness. <laughs> so the earth, this is, this is the state of creation. It was formless. It was worthless. It was vain. It was confusion, an empty place, a waste, a wilderness. Okay. And then the word void, it was formless and void, which comes from the Hebrew word. I'm not even going to try to say that. You can, you can try to say that if you want to. I'm not going to. Okay. I'll try to say it. Well, well, bohu. We'll just go with that. Um, so what that, what that word means, the word, the Hebrew word for void, um, again, from an unused root, meaning to be empty, uh, undistinguishable, ruin, emptiness, void. Uh, then lastly, darkness. Uh, if I looked into that, the word used here for darkness, the Hebrew word was choshek. That means darkness, figuratively, misery, destruction, death, ignorance, sorrow, wickedness, uh, obscurity. So all these, all these words that kind of that go behind the Hebrew meaning of the word. So I put all that together and Genesis 1, 2, kind of one way that I think it could be read and, and interpreted is now the earth became a desolate, worthless, and confusing waste, void and empty, covered in misery, destruction, and obscurity. Okay, so when you look into these words, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. I think there's a lot more going on here than simply saying that God just brought creation into existence in this way as a blank canvas to start the creation. To me, that makes no sense. That that's I have a really, really hard time making it that simple because I think there's so much more go, going on here when you look at the words. Again, if creation is meant as a visible expression of God's nature, then why would the first act of creation of God bringing something into creation be to, to bring something into creation that is desolate, worthless, a confusing waste, void, empty, covered in misery, destruction, and obscurity? I don't think that makes sense. Um, so I'm, I'm going to kind of continue to look at these words, the words formless and void. So formless uh, and void, uh, formless means confusion, emptiness, futile, meaningless, waste, desolation, void, uh, emptiness, and ruin. How does scripture use these words? When, when the scripture looks at words like this, um, even if it's not the same Hebrew word, when it, it speaks of in terms of things that are, are conf, uh, uses terms like confusion or emptiness or ruin, um, how does it, how does it use these terms? And so in scripture, I think every time you see these terms, uh, they're consistently connected to sin, evil, and the results of God's judgment. It's always, when you see these words used, both Old and New Testament, it's never in a positive light. It, it, these things are negative. They're all, always connected to sin. Isaiah 34, 11, um, and the context of this is that it's speaking about um, the judgment of God is speaking about God's wrath being poured out because of sin and rebellion. And it uses the same words as uh, as Genesis 1, 2. It uses the same words used for formless and void. So it says the Lord will stretch out over Edom a measuring line of chaos and of destruction. So these words are used in connection to judgment and sin. These are related to issues of judgment and sin in, in the Bible using the same words. And so immediately, I think we have good reason to think that when we we're seeing these words show up later in Isaiah uh, and they're, they're dealing with God's judgment on sin, I think to me, that makes me conclude that there's, again, there's more going on here in Genesis 1-2 than simply a, a, a blank canvas. There's judgment. There's something going on relating to sin and evil. So Romans 121, it says, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and darkened in their foolish hearts. So futility and darkness, 
again, sounds a lot like Genesis 1-2 and the state of creation being in a state of futility, emptiness, and darkness. And this is what is the state of those who rebel against God. Uh, Ephesians 4, 17, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and alienated. I think this word here, alienated, is very significant. Alienated from the life of God because the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. Separation from and alienation from the knowledge of God, the life of God, the presence of God results in alienation, darkness, and futility. So again, these words all, I think, very closely relate to what we're seeing the state of creation being in Genesis 1-2. The state that creation is in in Genesis 1-2 is the state that Paul uses this uh, uh, symbolic type of language about uh, darkness and light and, and futility to speak and describe the state of the wicked, the state of those who do not know God and therefore are in underneath God's judgment. They're described as, as being futile in their minds and darkened. Again, why, if this is simply a blank canvas in Genesis 1-2, does it use these words of, of futility, voidness, and darkness? I think there's a lot more going on here. So James 3.16, he says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder or chaos, formlessness, voidness, and every evil thing. So things like disorder, futility, Darkness, these are never presented in a positive light. They're never connected to righteousness. They're never connected to the character and nature of God. They're always presented as the polar opposite of righteousness, the polar opposite of God and who he is and what fellowship with him looks like. I think James 3.16 too, you're seeing something we're about to get into about Satan. You're, you're really seeing the... The, I think the state of mind that Satan was operating in that led to this Genesis 1-2 condition. So again, it says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, we're going to see later on that what, res what caused the results of Genesis 1-2, what caused the fall of Satan and, and his judgment has being cast through the earth, was selfish ambition in his heart. He says, do not be arrogant. Satan became arrogant and so lie against the truth. And his heart began to lie against the truth. He became opposed to the truth of who God was. This wisdom, this, this wisdom that Satan began to operate in that led to his downfall is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. The wisdom of that, that the wisdom that is um, produces a person operating and living in selfish ambition, arrogance, um, and jealousy, bitter jealousy in life. This is is the sort of wisdom that ultimately has its origination in demonic influence. This is a demonic wisdom. It has its source in that which is dark and evil. It has no source in God. It does not come from God. That's what James is trying to say. It doesn't come from above. It comes from the low place. It comes from evil. And again, this is this ultimately, I think this wisdom was birthed out of the sin of Satan. It entered into reality because it, it rose up in Satan's heart and he embraced it. So where, where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there is disorder and every evil thing. Satan began to operate in selfish ambition in this demonic wisdom. He began to operate it and walk in it, seeking his own pride, seeking after his own gain. He wanted to be worshipped. The result of that, James says, that sort of wisdom, he says, where that exists, there is disorder in every evil thing. I think where, where that kind of wisdom exists, it presents, it produces a separation from God that results not in the peace and the wisdom of God that is good and perfect and pleasing, but it results in this evil, demonic, disordered wisdom. Creation itself was impacted by that evil wisdom of Satan. When he operated in that wisdom, again, where there is that selfish ambition, it results in disorder. The selfish ambition of Satan resulted in the 
I think the physical expression of that was disorder. I think in the same way that creation uh, expresses is a physical expression of the spiritual reality of God's goodness. That was the original purpose of it. But I think when things go wrong in the spiritual realm, I think there is a, uh, when things went bad with Satan in the spiritual realm, there was a physical expression of that in creation as well. Um, when darkness and sin entered in the spiritual realm in Satan, in the heart of Satan, and, and it resulted in judgment, the ultimate result of that was that f- physical reality expressed that reality that happened in the spiritual realm. So selfish ambition results in disorder. And we see in Genesis 1-2, there's formlessness, void. Again, all these words contain that idea of disorder. Um, and so that I think this state of Genesis 1-2 is the result of selfish ambition. We can look at Genesis 1-2 and, and put that together with the rest of Scripture and conclude that what is happening here in Genesis 1-2 is happening because of selfish ambition, because of wisdom that is demonic and evil. It's not from above, but it's from, uh, from the result of pride. Okay, two more verses that kind of explain to us how the Bible views these sort of words, formlessness and void. Are these ever viewed in a positive light? How does the Bible use them? So Deuteronomy 28.20 says, The Lord will send on you, and this is talking to Israel when God is giving Israel um, these, these basically promises of both cursing and blessing based on whether they will uh, obey or disobey his word. So here's, here's some of the curses that God promises. Basically, again, the judgment that will result from a, a disconnection from God, a, a rebellion against them. It says, the Lord will send curses upon you, confusion and reproof and all to which you put your hand until you are destroyed and quickly perish because of the wickedness you've committed and forsaking him. So what does forsaking God result in? Forsaking God results in confusion. Confusion Disorder of heart and mind, uh, voidness, emptiness is is part of the judgment that results from forsaking God. To forsake God is to forsake the very source of order, of peace, of, of, of that which is coherent and right and good. And so I think, again, when Satan forsook God, it resulted in confusion. When God cast Satan to the earth and, and his angels as a judgment, it resulted in this physical state of the earth being in confusion and chaos. Um, and then lastly, 1 Corinthians uh, 14.33, For God is not a God of confusion. Uh, and other translations use in place of the word confusion, they'll say disorder, t- tumult, commotion, instability. So God is not a God of confusion. He's not a God of disorder, which again, I think begs the question, if God is not a God of confusion and disorder, why was creation in Genesis 1-2 in this state of being formless and void, darkness over the face of the deep? Um, I think I've gone long enough in this one, but I think this is a good setup for for next time. We'll jump in and we'll look at um, uh, Satan and his fall and how I think Genesis 1-2 points to us uh, uh, and shows us that reality and kind of puts it, gives us a timeline. Again, we all know that at one point Satan fell, but I think Genesis 1-2 kind of, kind of gives us that timeline of when that took place. 